today on CityCast DC. It's 420 week and just days before the National Cannabis Festival. So we're talking to its founder about the city's ever-shifting, complicated relationship with weed. There's been stigma, criminalization, standoffs with Congress, and now the D.C. government just changed the rules again around how residents can buy and sell cannabis. Today's Tuesday, April 18th. I'm Bridget Todd, and here's what D.C.'s talking about. Caroline, in 2016, you founded the National Cannabis Festival, which we know is happening again this weekend. It is an issue that is near and dear to my heart, so I'm very excited to hear more about the event and what it includes. But first, what was it like for you personally to have set up this event as someone who grew up in the D.C. area at a time when cannabis use and also just kind of talking about cannabis was a lot less accepted? Um, Well, first, thank you for having me. I think that I would say that uh, my high school and college self is really cheering me on. Definitely growing up in the D.C. area, I think as young people, we knew not to go into Montgomery County with cannabis and certainly don't go over into Virginia with cannabis um, because we knew how stringent the laws were and how seriously cannabis possession was taken. So to be able to produce this event as an adult now is really an incredible experience. And to know that there's an entire generation and generations to come of young people who are going to grow up in a world where cannabis is not criminalized and where people who use it aren't considered criminals is really exciting. Yeah, it's such a sad thing because obviously I'm happy that we're in this place where it's more normalized and talked about, but that also comes with this sadness of all the different traumas and all the different ways that people have been thrown in jail, had families torn apart for so long. And now we're in this place where it's normalized, where we can talk about it, where there's not such a big stigma. Do you feel like you're navigating those same feelings when you talk about the issue? Absolutely. I mean, the festival itself takes place less than half a mile from the D.C. jail, where there are still a lot of people, mostly black and brown people in there, who are behind bars for nonviolent drug offenses and for cannabis possession or sales. So it is a bit of the twilight zone to find yourself living in a world where there are people making millions of dollars on this plant, other people desperate to just be able to get into the industry, and then people who are still behind bars all for touching the same plant. So I want to get into that because, you know, when different states started talking about legalization, there was so much reporting about like, oh, entrepreneurs getting into the space. But so many of the people that I saw elevated in that conversation, frankly, were white folks. And so I love what you're doing with Supernova Women to make sure that we're all having equal access to this industry. How do you feel like D.C. compares to other cities when it comes to making sure that black folks, brown folks and women are really having fair representation in the space? So first, I think what's so awesome about D.C. is we're such an activist minded city. Wherever you live in the city and whatever you do for work, you are probably a little bit more in touch with and aware of the work of the government around you. So that's something to me that is so unique and cool about the residents and the community that we have in the city. You know, I think that as far as equity in the space, we're still proving that we're going to have a strong program. But I think that the groundwork is there and the signals that the city intends to move in the right direction on this are there. I look to places like Oakland for models that I think are really inspiring and really work well. That's where I do um, a lot of the work with Supernova Women and a lot of what we've learned about programs in Oakland. Those are things that we hope to bring to Washington, D.C. and to other cities that are similar to Oakland and Washington, D.C. And when I say that, I mean extremely diverse cities. I think that being able to spend the past few years working with people like Amber Center and Whitney Beatty, who are out on the West Coast in L.A. and Oakland, respectively, and seeing the work that they've been doing and understanding how that work has moved legislation in their cities is really inspiring. And I hope to be able to bring them to D.C. to share what they know and hopefully be a pillar for social equity in D.C. here. Let's talk a bit about legislation. What role did NCF play in helping to normalize and legalize cannabis in D.C.? You know, I like to think of the festival as a great platform for the cannabis community to show what an adult use market could look like in this country. 
I think when people come to the festival, they see our robust education programs. They see how peaceful and friendly our attendees are. They see the creativity among all of the exhibitors, how excited all the food truck vendors are to feed people, and then just the kind of diverse music that people in cannabis culture love. So I like to think that the festival has helped normalize and make the idea of cannabis culture more palatable to people who perhaps don't touch the plant but once a year or maybe at their college reunion that one time. Um, But, you know, to know that you don't have to spend all day thinking about cannabis or even be a daily user or monthly user to just be part of the culture. Cold War era defectors sold secrets outside the British embassy on Mass Ave. Allied operatives met at the Mayflower Hotel in 1925 and again in 2010. And odds are, there was a spy on your train this morning. With more than 10,000 spies, D.C. truly is the capital of spycraft. And if you want to understand their secrets, step into their radio transmitting shoes or into James Bond's Aston Martin, you need to visit the International Spy Museum. Located just off the National Mall, the Spy Museum features 30,000 square feet of exhibits and artifacts. They've got ciphers, submarines, and the actual ice axe that killed Leon Trotsky. While most DC museums discourage me from touching the artwork, the Spy Museum gave me an undercover identity and tested my skills as a covert operative in a series of interactive challenges. Book your visit today at spymuseum.org. So here in DC, the laws around cannabis are so confusing. I know that regulations changed like just last month. Where are we at right now? Like, can I legally buy weed? Can I sell it? Can I smoke a joint in Rock Creek Park? Like, what's happening right now? So... Recently, Mayor Muriel Bowser signed legislation that's really going to change how medical cannabis works in this city. I think that before we dive into a discussion of what's happening in D.C., we should talk about the limitations. And I don't normally like to start conversations by talking about limitations, but that is an important thing when we're talking about cannabis laws in D.C. We, of course, have to get congressional approval on all major legislation in the city. They control our budget. And since Initiative 71 was passed in 2015, Congress has said that D.C. can't have a full adult use market. And there was a point a few years ago where Congress even said, um, a man named Andy Harris in particular, they threatened the D.C. Council and they threatened our mayor and said, if you take these steps forward and create this adult use market, there's going to be trouble. We're going to impact your budget. So that's, I think, something to keep in mind as we talk about what D.C. can do. So recently, the mayor and the council approved legislation that will expand our medical program because we still can't have an adult use or recreational program. So they will be lifting the license cap and allowing more dispensaries and cultivation centers in. They're saying that's an unlimited number, which I think is very exciting. But I do think there are also limitations on that that involve the regulations around where you can actually place dispensaries and cultivation in the city, you know, not near schools, not near treatment centers. Um, But it is a very positive sign that they want to lift this license cap and let more entrepreneurs in. As part of that, they are talking about creating transitional licenses for some of the unregulated businesses that have been operating in this space for the past seven years, and then also giving access to license types for current licensees that will hopefully help boost revenue um, since they've been operating in a subprime market for the past couple of years. So I think these are all incredible and exciting signs, but I do think that advocates in D.C. need to remain very vigilant. We need to ensure that this market remains our own and that we are serving our own communities and that we're making sure that D.C. isn't just another cannabis market, but hopefully really a blueprint market for the rest of the nation. Let's talk a little bit about how the festival is really doing that. So tell me about the festival. What's it going to be like? You know, what's what's the vibe going to be like there? It's going to be wonderful. Um, I really feel very positive about this year's festival. We have such terrific exhibitors, amazing artists. I mean, Juicy J and 2 Chains. It's going to be so much fun. We have all of our advocacy partners on site. This year, we have six education pavilions. So you can go and learn about policy. I think there are at least two panels focused specifically on D.C. in our policy pavilion. You can learn about cannabis as medicine and just cannabis as part of your wellness practice in our wellness pavilion. 
We have our culinary pavilion. I think that sort of explains itself, but think eating contests and classes on cooking with cannabis. We also have our, oh, there's so many of them now, our grow school stage, which is our growers world this year, where you can learn all about cultivation. I'm kind of moving through my head around the site map as I say these things out loud. What am I missing? We also, oh, this is exciting. Brand new this year, we have our psychedelics pavilion because we really want the DC community to be educated about natural plant medicine since things like psilocybin and ayahuasca were decriminalized back in 2021. So who generally attends the festival? What What does the makeup look like? It's a really wonderful rainbow of people, really. We have people from 21 to 85 And so much so that we have a dedicated seniors lounge for what I like to call our golden buds. So if you're 65 or over, come party. It's super lit in there. I think you'll have a great day. Um, This year, we're also introducing our LGBTQIA plus lounge that's being hosted by the Washington Blade. So that's going to be a really wonderful, vibrant space. And every year we have our veterans lounge also. So if you or someone in your family is an active or a retired service member, please stop by. There are going to be some awesome veterans groups like Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America and the Balanced Veterans Network who are conducting programming in there throughout the day. The programs are all included, of course. We have some great lounges. And when you get hungry, check out one of 70 plus food and restaurant options on site and check out education programming, of course. And finally, the Exhibitor Village, which has more than 120 brands, many of which are small businesses from up and down the East Coast. There's a lot going on. (laughs) When you talk about this, I can see in your face, I can hear how much this means to you. What would you say is the intention of this festival? What are you trying to bring to the community or show? Why bring all these diverse people together in service of this? You know, I think that I took it really personally when cannabis was first legalized in D.C. and I went to a conference And I didn't really see anybody that I knew in the room. I'm like, well, that's weird. I know a lot of people that love cannabis and would love to learn more about this business. I certainly didn't see many black or brown people. I didn't see many women. And I looked and I was like, you know, this was a really expensive event to attend. Um, I was working one of these conferences. So that's how I ended up in the room. And I really just wanted to create a program that was affordable, approachable, and accessible to people in our community. And lucky for me, I have a team of mostly women. Shout out to Toby. He's the one man on our team. Um, But we have this incredible group of black and brown women who have been crowded around this event for the past seven years now, literally through thick and thin, through very thin. The pandemic years are a little rough. I think it just means a lot to all of us to create a terrific experience for the people that attend and to make sure that the cannabis conversation in Washington, D.C., is not just about this so-called green rush, but actually gives people resources, a sense of community, and reminds them of the challenges that are still out there and the folks that are still behind bars. In addition to the festival, I know that you all have an entire week of programming, correct? Absolutely. So we have 420 Week every year before the festival. We have some incredible programs, many of which are free, planned for this year, and a brand new program called 420 Food Week which gives you deals and specials on snacks and munchies around the city at different restaurants. So go to the 420 week page on the National Cannabis Festival website. But on Wednesday, 419, we'll be celebrating Bicycle Day with Oakland Hi-Fi at Selena, where we're hosting a Grow Your Own Mushroom workshop. So come and check that out. On 420, we'll be hosting a fun run that leaves from Meridian Hill Park, aka Malcolm X Park, at 8.40 a.m. So come and check out our 4.2 miler fun runner walk. We also have our congressional forum inside the Capitol building in the congressional auditorium on 420, and our kickback party at Songbird Music House that evening. So please join us at all of those wonderful events. Of course, we have the big festival on the 22nd, so we hope you'll join us there. But next week, it's all going to be about cannabis policy, cannabis community, and celebrating cannabis culture. Wow. Bicycling, gardening, good food, music, cannabis. Sounds like a great combination of things. (laughs) I agree. We are so excited. Awesome. Caroline, where can folks find out more about attending the festival and the work that you're doing? So you can visit nationalcannabisfestival.com, C-A-N-N-A-B-I-S, 
for those of you that don't spell the word <laughs> cannabis every single day. Um, so it's nationalcannabisfestival.com. You can still grab tickets there. And please come and join us. Come check out GCJ, Two Chains, Backyard Band will be there, Cumbia Heights. We have a lot of amazing DC talent on the stage. It's going to be a really wonderful day. Caroline, thanks so much for being here. See you at the festival. Thank you so much for having me. And before you go, some quick news. The House of Representatives is expected to vote tomorrow in favor of overturning D.C. police reforms. The legislation would expand public access to police disciplinary records and weaken the police union. This is the third time this year that the House is trying to exert its control over D.C., but President Joe Biden says that he will veto this bill if it comes across his desk. Meanwhile, George Washington University's board has decided to authorize roughly half of the school's police officers to carry firearms on campus. Howard University, Catholic University, and the University of the District of Columbia already allow campus cops to carry guns. And lastly, in an effort to protect Maryland renters from discriminatory practices, Attorney General Anthony Brown plans to sign the Civil Rights Enforcement Bill to give his office the power to enforce federal and state civil rights laws. Currently, only the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights has that authority. And we'll leave you with today's DC Life Hack, courtesy of Caroline. Well, I'm excited because every day during 420 Food Week, Dolceza Gelato is going to be offering their special munchies flavor in honor of the National Cannabis Festival. So folks can swing by their April 15th to the 23rd to taste this special flavor. I don't know if you've had the Dolceza milk chocolate gelato, but it's like the perfect not too sweet flavor. So you can eat a lot of it. Um, and then they're putting in chocolate covered potato chips. So it's like kind of salty, but a little sweet. And then pretzels and peanut butter cups and caramel. And it's just every bite is different. It's like a party in your mouth. So I highly recommend going by any Dolceza location from the 15th to the 23rd and trying out the Munchies gelato. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, why not share it with your favorite cannabis user? And subscribe to our morning newsletter, too. We'll be back tomorrow morning with even more news from around the city. Talk to you then.